Welcome to Interplay Conversations in Music. This is Michael Shapiro, your host. And today, I'm very, very pleased to have on our show, straight from Vienna, Andreas Hefliger, pianist and friend. Good to see you, Andreas. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Of course. Me. You know, I know a lot about you, and I know about your pianism because I've listened to your recordings, and uh, I look forward in a better world to see you uh, in face-to-face, -face, either on trips to Europe or in a concert hall here. I, I do want to talk to you about pianism and about your approach to the keyboard, because there are many pianists who will see this. Um, there are pianists who, what I call, are barkers or harsh with the instrument at being percussive. But I don't find that with your playing. Your playing is in service of the music, but it is very musical, and the sounds are always consistently beautiful. Can you talk about your approach to the piano physically? I'm curious. Hmm. But looking for sounds was something that, when I was growing up, was one of the one of the few advices that I actually got from my father, uh, which said, "Look for as many sounds as you can," and I did, and it it did pay off. So that's something that's been with me for for a very very long time, and um, I think then really the uh, the biggest discovery was that with um, at a certain point, I realized that I wanted to move very much from the center with the piano, so that I, I tried to have as little as few blocks in between what I think and what comes out of the piano as possible, so that the muscles contract as little as possible and do motions that are fluid. And that helps. That actually helps the sound quite a bit because. As the second you, you tighten up somewhere in the body, the sound gets tighter as well. It's fascinating because I heard recently that some people from contemporary accounts talk about the playing of Beethoven as a young man. Apparently, he was very still at the piano. Um, nothing like you know what some of our young people do today of moving all over the place, and, and older people too, I suppose. Um, do you study at least what you can with the, with your ancestors in the piano, of how they uh, approached playing. Um, for me, the the stillness at the piano um, is something that's just quite natural. I I move when I have to, um, and I don't move for show, because it's it it doesn't seem to be something that that does a whole lot for the music, and um, I find that. Uh, the audience doesn't need it, but there are some people who move naturally a lot, and then I don't mind at all. I just think it's it's become an issue where uh, maybe um, maybe a certain generation is pushing each other forward with with something that they deem to be successful. And then that could change actually the the art form. You think it's more affectation if it if it's an affectation that's carried forward, like singers. If, if it's an affectation, then then I find it's distracting. And um, but I I wouldn't want to throw knives, you know, because I think the art form also can change. It um, if that's what that generation needs, then that's what it is. You know, cinema has changed so much over the last let's say six decades, you know, in the, in the number of shots. I remember uh, suddenly about 10 years ago watching some movies and I could hardly follow because they were so fast, the cuts were so fast. And of course, the stillness of the old cinema is something we cherish, but it also belongs at that time. I want to talk to you about hand position because I've been reading recently about the so-called Russian school versus the German-Austrian school of holding the hand over the piano. Is there any value to that? I mean, if you look at Horowitz's hands, they're extremely flat. Rubinstein, not so much. Um, and Schnabel and uh, uh, Richter are very different. Do you think about those, the actual position of the hand at the piano? I'm very curious about that. I think about it quite a lot because um, one wants to find the most economized and um, 
it well easy way of playing in a way and um the the differences that you've mentioned are maybe some that um stem from the from the kind of hand it is uh you know horowitz's hands were quite quite different from rubinstein's and but rubinstein played with very relaxed um not bent but not straight fingers either and um i find that that is probably the the smartest thing to do because as the as the muscles move in in opposites if you bend your fingers you automatically challenge these muscles here they have to work to bend the fingers that's their that's their job and so to lift the fingers again then means that these muscles here who lift have to work harder because these ones are already engaged yeah so the less you the less you the less you are in the way of yourself, the better it is, really. But the hands can also differ. It jumps to a question. I, a very good friend of mine is a young pianist uh, just graduating from your alma mater and my alma mater, Juilliard School. I'm curious about the practicing regimen because this young pianist had to take a full year off because she practiced way too much, hours and hours and hours and hours. I mean, almost compulsive stuff. What is your practicing regimen? I'm very curious to hear for someone who's been in the business such a long time. Well, I um, I would say that that now is a moment in my life where I practice more than I ever have. Um, probably, with the exception of of just around between fifteen and twenty, when I when I wanted to start achieving things, but. Now is a, is a moment where I have a lot of time because of, of the way my life is situated right now. There's no demands from my, from my daughter. There are no demands from my parents at this point. And um, so I have a lot of time. And I use that to practice simply because I enjoy it and I like discovering things. What I do make sure is when I'm in, in a situation where I have to practice under pressure, so I have to learn something new in a time frame, or, um, or I, uh, you know, something is coming up that is that is going to be a big challenge. Um, then I work with a practice book, and I work in five minute increments. And after fifteen minutes, I I get up for five minutes, and that works really well because at the end of the day, I I know exactly how much time I've actually practiced. Rather than um, rather than spend time in the practice room, so uh, these books are really helpful. I find, um, and it's also great to look back at it, um, maybe before a performance. You know, when you have your premiere and you say, "Wow, did I practice enough?" And you can look at <laughs> look at it and you see, you know, that you've you've practiced eighty five hours, and then that should do it. Um, and I think these uh, things like that can be super helpful actually to know about. Question, what practice books do you use? I just have a little uh, book where I make um, I make a line for every five minutes. No, 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 but wait, do you use printed published practice books? Like, No, I make, I make my own. I have it either as, as a notebook on the iPad or I have an actual book with me that, um, and it's nice to go back and see uh, for the Amman Concerto, for example, I had um, I had logged hundreds of hours in in a four week uh, time frame, but I could only do it because I would always get up in between. For our listeners who don't know about this, um, Andreas recently premiered uh, the Dita Amman Piano Concerto, and I know you did it in Boston with my friend, our friend in common, Susanna Melki, um, okay. and. Uh, Dita Amen is not known to Americans. I will tell you that. I didn't know of him until I heard about the concerto. And he is a contemporary of yours from Switzerland, no? He is, yes. Um, he He's a spectacular composer who uh, composes very meticulously and very slowly. So um, that's maybe why his output is not as big as some others. Um, but he's worth a listen. And... Um, I got this piece five weeks before the proms premiere, so that was that was quite that was quite a challenge to to get it ready and to learn 
uh, 35 minute uh, fiendishly difficult contemporary piece. And um, that I think was really, there the practice books, for example, helped a lot. Because if you, you know, if you go to the point where you practice so much that you're hurting, um, then you're, in a way, you probably have a wish to be hurt. You, you need to find ways not to hurt yourself so that you can enjoy making music. Let's talk about making music. The wonderful thing that draws me to your playing, which draws me to orchestras that I conduct or musicians that I work with that are special to me, is the singing quality of your playing. You obviously, coming from a family of a great singer and having been an accompanist and a chamber music player all your life, understand what we say of Deutsch, Luft, breath, or the Atem, you know? Yeah. I learned this from Bamberger, actually with Karl Bamberger, who I told you I studied with and uh, worked with him and just learning the how to phrase, how to turn a phrase, how to breathe into a phrase. When I write music, my own music, and I tell this to my compositions, my private composition students, I say, sing your lines, sing your counterpoint, sing the bass line, sing the middle voices, sing the top, work on singing because it will infuse in your music. So talk to me about the vocal aspect of the piano artistry of Andreas Hefliger. Well, vocal aspect is, is certainly, I mean, that's just my heritage. So I, I would say I often compare it to, to being the son of a shoemaker, you know, where you'd know it's, it's just, you've smelt it so much that you know when the leather is ready to make the shoe, you don't have to think about it. And that was really, in a way, my upbringing was that uh, I heard the lessons constantly obviously going on. I heard my father practice. And then at a certain time, a certain point quite early on, um, when I was eight or nine, I started accompanying also the students. So I was cheap labor, so to speak. And um, that, is a, that is a wonderful education to get. And I'm tremendously thankful for it uh, because it was just, you're always surrounded with, with that repertoire. And then it became natural that I would try to imitate the voice on the piano. And the piano is one of the instruments where you can really, um, you can create all the sounds there are in the orchestra and in the human voice. Uh, you just have to know how. You have to know how to make a note grow. And it's possible. It's, it's, it seems physically impossible, but it's possible to do. And um, I was... Uh, you know, just very, very lucky to grow up with that, I think. You know, you uh, remind me of this discussion of my hearing uh, when I was a kid, Thelonious Monk, the great jazz oh, player. Yeah, wonderful. Who was famous for bending notes on the piano. I want to talk to you about the inflection in your solo work of doing chamber music, because I know you're a fine chamber music player. And to me, the greatest pianists that I've worked with as a conductor who've worked with the orchestra are people who've done chamber music. Because as we progress during a concerto and they're listening and they're molding their phrases to what the oboe might have done or the strings, it just comes straight naturally out of the chamber music. So describe to, me, to us, please, your work with singers and your work with chamber musicians how that informs your solo piano playing? Well, I think that um, uh, f that for me, music is music. So I don't make a difference between between the the different genres. Um, the reaction is interesting in chamber music, and it's also very interesting with singers. With singers, you have to uh, know, as as you're well aware. Um, as they're breathing, when the note will probably come. And then you have to wait a little bit longer um, for the consonant to sound. And, and you have to find just the right moment to play. And all this in sometimes very, very difficult repertoire. So it's really in, interesting um, to, to work together in that way. 
And then when you're uh, playing chamber music with a larger group, you have this maybe in the quintet with four other people who are all reacting off you and you're reacting to them. Again, in a very different way, very different to play a quintet with a, with a formed quartet or with uh, four other individual players. And uh, in, in concerto, you have to be well aware that there is a boss on stage too. And um, you have to find the way to create the music that you want to create and be diplomatic about it and um, not force yourself upon them. That I think is, is extremely important because they have a job of keeping uh, 100 people together, you know, which, which is completely inconceivable to me. <laughs> so I think, I think that um, each situation calls for like a different uh, side of myself, but in the end, it's all music. And from chamber music, you learn so much for the solo playing because you see a Beethoven sonata, for example, then as a quartet. Um, and you, you learn to listen for the viola voice or you learn to see the voices move very, very similarly. And um, so you can make, if you've had the luck like me to play with some extraordinary violists, um, you start imitating that sound. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also understand how that line can jump out and become like a three-dimensional line in the middle of everything. I'd like to talk to you about your per perspective series, which I would love you, by the way, to do here in the States. I know that for years, uh, you'll have to tell us how many, you've been at the Wigmore Hall in London, and then recording often what you do there for your perspective series on what we say BIS labels, BIS, B-I-S records. Um, on your perspective series, I've noticed there's almost, almost every year there seems to be a Beethoven uh, sonata, but with or variations, and but with that is a contemporary piece of music. First, a question about Beethoven. I understand why people want to play Beethoven. Nothing I like better than conducting Beethoven or studying Mrs. Solemnus as I am now. But this is great music that's been played by a lot of great people before you. Why you? Why Beethoven? Why now? I think for a, it's it's a tremendous legacy, and for any musician, um, and maybe especially pianist with the sonatas, who knows? Um, I think to spend a lifetime involving yourself in these pieces and taking them up again and again and again, finding new things in in them, is just a tremendously rewarding journey. Um, so. I would do it also if I didn't record or didn't play them publicly, because I find it just a great way to spend your day. But um, I have, by the way, done them in the in the States as well. Um, I just dedicated a lot of time in the past, I would say, 10 years also to my family. And as I say, now that I have um, a, a larger time window open again, I will come much more to the United States. We're in the States same position, well. Andreas. <laughs> Well, yes, it's it's a great thing, you know, and uh, when you have a child, as you know, um, it's painful to be away. And um, I I did quite consciously set the family life on an even importance level, if not more, as the career. Yeah. And I think that I fared very well with that. So this it's a lot of fun. I feel good. I'm in good, good shape to play. And... Um, uh, it's a great time now to start doing much, much more again. You know, you mentioned the Beethoven sonatas, which the 32 sonatas and the incredible growth in those pieces. I listened just this past weekend to a recording, which hopefully will be online when people watch this broadcast, um, of the Hammerklavier. And of course, we know that Beethoven had two Hammerklavier sonatas, at least in his published edition, but the famous one is the one that you played. In many ways, for this composer, some of the music of the later period is somewhat incomprehensible. And I will only tell you why. Because it's unpredictable often where he goes. And it's almost like very contemporary music when you listen to it. Um, that 
the side rooms that he happens to go into. We're in this mansion, and suddenly we're in a closet, and we don't know why we're there. And then it comes out into another grand room. I'm curious how you build structure, uh, because some pianists just play music, but that's not the way I hear Andreas Hefliger. I hear you are playing as highly structural in the macro sense, but in the micro sense, marvelously detailed. So I'm curious, is this just come through practicing? What is your study process like? First of all, thank you for that. That's, that's a really nice observation and obviously uh, something that I'm really happy about. Um, I, I just spent time and um, I think, uh, I think it was Edwin Fisher who said, learning a piece is like walking through a forest day after day after day. And um, every day you recognize one more detail. Maybe the bird who's always singing at that spot or the, the bush that looks like that or um, the stones that always lie exactly in that formation on the ground. And I try to walk through the piece like that. I don't do anything consciously at first. And with time you, you understand certain things. So for, so for me, the, the, um, the third is tremendously important in, in Opus 106. And I notice things like the development in the, in the third movement is just a, a collection of falling thirds. And it goes on and on and on and on. And the third is right in the beginning of the, of the piece um, stated so strongly. And then you understand the, the little, um, the importance of moving up the half step from the B flat to the B obviously a, a very Beethovenian gesture as well. And then you start to understand and listen for these kinds of developments. And um, you're right, the, in the fugue, it can become borderline incomprehensible. But I think if you take um, what, he was, what he was maybe trying to do is write in a formal way, something that he learned very strongly when he came to Vienna. He studied with Albrecht Berger, who was the, um, the musician at the, at the Stephansdom. I don't know what that position is called. And, and um, he learned to write um, uh, polyphonic music extremely well and extremely carefully. I just so want to interrupt you and, and mention that with Albrecht Berger, and he studied the, stud the work of, of Fuchs, F-U-X, and yeah. we, we actually have, the books exist of his workbooks, Beethoven's workbooks with Albrechtsberger of yeah. Fuchs. I was taught Fuchs method as well. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. And Albrechtsberger was actually famous for taking a lot of license uh, with fugal writing. So things that, um, um, octaves, for example, or things that... Um, for us in, in counterpoint, we would be chided for, were quite acceptable to him. So then you take a, a theme like, the, like Opus 106 has, where, you know, if you were to give this to a church musician, ask him to improvise on it, um, he would say, you're crazy. It's not possible. And um, you take a theme that is that long and you build out of, out of little elements of it an entire movement like that. And I find that fascinating. Yes, absolutely. And I, I do want to mention one other thing, if we can just move on from, you know, the late works of Beethoven to me sound like contemporary music, and I think they'll always sound like that to everyone. I wanted to talk to you, though, about what you do in the Perspective series and also in all of your uh, piano recitals. I know you play concerti. That's another whole story as well, in addition to the chamber music and the songs. But in the solo works, when you do the Perspective series, on your recordings, and I know at the Wigmore Hall and other, and other places all over the world, you often put a contemporary piece on the program by a living composer. You've done works of uh, Sofia Gubaidulina, who I met actually in Bergen when we were both at the festival. I conducted, she was a featured composer, and I spent time with her. But you've also done works of Thomas Addis, uh, I think Yogi, Georgi uh, Ligeti, and other people. If you're doing a, this Beethoven sonata or that Schumann piece or that Modas Mussorgsky pictures, whatever, you're also adding another piece by a living or just recently past composer. 
why that piece? What is that piece? Why is that it's, piece it's, there? It's, yeah, there's no method uh, to the madness. It's just um, I I wait for good programs to come into my head, and that's why sometimes there's a big gap between the perspective series. I'll do other recordings in between, but that series is very dear to me. It is it's basically explainable as, as saying I want to build an excellent program around Beethoven sonatas. I don't want to play an all Beethoven um, CD, but if that's if it's necessary to do that, I will also do that. It's not, there's not, um, as I said, there's no method. I just find it more enlightening to hear programs. Sometimes they're intellectually based, um, where you're going after a certain idea, or sometimes they're just, I think, sounds that I would like to hear follow each other. Sometimes I, I'm thinking extremely in, in the harmonies and uh, build, a, build a program around the tritone. Or it's just, there's things that work for me and actually in the end, they end up um, coming together so that you can listen to this whole CD and feel like you're walking through a well-curated room of paintings. You know, you did that with the Hamaklavir of Beethoven. Didn't you have the uh, a selection from Franz Liszt's Année de Pèlerinage? The Année de Pèlerinage, yeah. Um, well, Liszt had the, had the Opus 106 in his fingers since he was 11. And, um, but it hadn't been played publicly. And when he was about 24, 25, um, he was living with Marie Dabou, I guess, in, in Geneva. And um, was composing the Anna de Pellerinar Suisse at that time. And the situation was, I think, tricky for him because Thalberg was having tremendous successes in Paris and news would reach Switzerland of this virtuoso who was, who was um, you know, playing these opera paraphrases and could just play anything. And um, Liszt's answer to this was that he went to Paris and he gave the premiere of Opus 106. Um, Berlioz was the critic for it, and um, it must have been a, a tremendous um, occasion because people had studied the music, but nobody had really thought of it as playable. And um, so that's why, why these pieces go on the perspective disc together for me, because Liszt had the Hammerklavier in his, in his head, in his mind, um, at the time of composing these other pieces. Before we go, I know I've been asking this question of your colleagues on this wonderful interplay show today with Andreas Hefliger. I do want to ask you a question. Going forward, out of this period, what are your hopes and dreams, musically? I think, you know, but when... The virus first hit and things started shutting down. I said to my wife, you know, it's fantastic because we're up here in the mountains. We were in, in Switzerland at the time and I only had a digital piano and we couldn't actually go down. We had to stay up in, at 1700 meters and um, spend three months there. And I said to her, look, it's, it's fantastic because if we can't play concerts, we can still practice. And even on the digital, if I can't practice, I can still do music in my head. And um, it's just satisfying, you know, to, to be involved with music is tremendously satisfying and it's a gift. And I say that to your young student, maybe who, whose hands are hurting, that um, it's the most, one of the most divine ways to spend your life, I think. And um, so hopes or fears, I think we all need to, to see that actually just playing music or, or being interested in music is already a super satisfying um, way of spending your time. If you can put it out and you, know, you can make a CD or if you can go and travel again and play in, uh, in concerts, that is of course tremendous. And I've played two small concerts now here um, for you know, 100 people or 200 people. And it's tremendous to feel the adrenaline again, of course. 
But I think it's also an, uh, an occasion to look for new mediums. Um, maybe why I, why I created the movie of, of 106. Um, and uh, I, I think just let your imagination roam and, and nothing can stop music. Well, this has been a very satisfying time for me. And I know we could talk for hours, but this is a half hour broadcast. And uh, Andreas Heffliger, wonderful pianist, speaking to me from Vienna today. Thank you for joining us on Interplay Conversations in Music. I'm your host, Michael Shapiro. Thank you.